your head up. What is the problem? I'll tell you the problem. Go get it. Peace. Love. Understand. Dent the world with kindness. So how was your day? It was good. I'm stressed. But you know, is the nature of life. What do they call them? Work? Yeah, but it's life as well. So it's work that doesn't yes. give you stress, something else will give you stress. Right? Yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to after our conversation, just Winding decompress. Down. Yeah. You understand? You know how like that ball that I was pumping yesterday, if I just let the air out. That's going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, this is the first time I have ever worn lashes by myself. Oh, really now? You did a Yes, this job. is the most uncomfortable, discomfortable, and uh, what's another? Miscomfortable. <laughs> so undis and miscomfortable, <laughs> you know, thing that can happen to a human being. I mean, I need... COVID to be over so I can go to my last lady. So, mm -hmm. um, should we give a disclaimer? I think we should so, because I mean, I was infuriated when I started reading this stuff. I actually was like, we need to do this now. Like, I was like, let me call her. Let's just get, because I need, I need to breathe. I may need to go get my Xanax. I need to breathe because I was so mad. I was like, oh my God, this is like horrifying, yeah. you know? Um, so you know, for me, I read as much as I could read considering that I didn't have that much time to prep. And, you know, whenever I know, and I'm sure it's with you talking about something that you feel very passionate about, your passion is going to override sometimes the facts. Correct. I don't have kids and I'm afraid to have kids. I didn't even have this fear till I started reading the stuff. I'm like, I know one bump, you know, and for you guys that don't understand what that is, it's Nigerian slang for I don't want to have kids because, you know, it's like, it's so horrifying, you know? So I know that emotions are going to get involved. So that's disclaimer. So another disclaimer that we want to put out there um, to everyone um, is that we're just two girlfriends just chatting it up. Um, we're not the experts on these topics. Um, and so we're just really speaking our opinions and just speaking on what we think should be either right or what's wrong about these certain, you know, uh, subject matters that we're going to be bringing to the world. Um, so we're not experts. Don't sue us because, you know, it's not, we don't have any. The show is called Speaking and Sipping. So how can you sue somebody that's speaking and sipping? You can't do that. <laughs> Listen, but you know what? I don't sip. And I don't have anything to sip on right now. So for next episode, I'm going to have my water or my salsa water so I can sip on something as well. So we can, you know, be sipping together, you know? That's because I'm not on that coast. You would be <laughs> sipping. <laughs> <laughs> With a straw, maybe. <laughs> so you could take little, little sips. Yes, exactly. Little... <laughs> Wow. Mm. Yes. So let's jump right into it. So I think our first topic okay. um, is um, like you sort of kind of touched on is um, the maternal mortality and period um, in the United States, but more so it affecting black women three to four times more than our counterparts mm -hmm. um it's just downright disgraceful you know the case study that really jumped out at me um mm -hmm. like i shared with you was um judge glenda hatchett's daughter-in-law that was the first time it came to my you know attention and i was like whoa but the mm -hmm. biggest thing that makes it really sickening is and that's how you know it's a racial issue mm -hmm. more so is no matter how rich you are so your socioeconomic class does not matter. You could be so educated. You could be so well-rounded. Yeah, someone, someone that knows how to advocate for themselves no, because exactly. could, it's having education. And then on top of the education, knowing, knowing what the right thing is yeah. and advocating for yourself, you know, cause those are two different things and knowing how to navigate the healthcare system. Um, 
And I tell so, what's wrong with that. And just from experience, I can tell you what's wrong with that. And I think there's just such a misconception. It's still that God complex. You're mm -hmm. in the hands and at the mercy of people you think should have your best interest. Experts who should have your help, your help, like should know what to do and how to navigate the situation yeah. no matter what, you know, no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. And, and so you, you sort of kind of let go, you know, and trust yeah. this person, be it a doula, be it a nurse, be it a doctor, to really treat you. And then the outcome is still not turning out to be the best for African American women. Um, and so, like I was saying, uh, Kira, oh, I think it's Patrick <sighs> Johnson, was the first. Yeah, Kira Johnson. Was the first uh, case that jumped out at me. And it's just such a sad story. And it recently just pops so again in the um, in the news um, with um, Shah Asia. So, so you know, with all the um, you know, it's a it's a very tense uh, climate right now. And so I think yeah. it's concerning the African American community is just really amplified more, which I think is actually a good time for these issues to to really come out. Um, and so, of course, that hit the headlines too. Yeah. What's that look? Um, I mean, when you say it's a good time for it to come out, it's, I mean, because I somewhat feel that it's getting overshadowed, you know, because there are other things that are happening that is causing this to kind of, it just kind of becomes part of what's going on. When I, I really think that, like I said, I was infuriated that this is so serious. This is downright scary. It is. You know what I mean? It's like you go to the hospital at the most vulnerable stage of your life Maybe as a female, the hell. you know, Never. you are in pain. Your body is all out of whack and you are holding on to the hope that these people are going to get you through this. Mm -hmm. I am speechless. So going through stats, um, you know, cause again, this was, um, the maternal maternity rate, um, statistics has not been available for the very longest time. Why the U S government refuses to, you know, to put the, um, the results out there was just downright ridiculous. So the, <laughs> the last results that were actually out published was in 2017. And it's just downright disgraceful. And I think, again, there's just trying to, uh, there's a lot of um, trying to cover the real issue there. And uh -huh. we in the community know we are losing more black women than we are losing our counterparts, right? Um, I think the other race, you know, just to be, you know, fair and, you know, just to shed a light because a life is a life lost. Um, yeah. The African, the American Indian um, race are the second, mm -hmm. as well as the Native Alaskan community are the, so we're the first, they're the second and third uh, race that are greatly affected by maternity, uh, maternal mortality. And again, why the U.S. decided not to publish the results is just downright disgraceful. I think they're cover, they're trying to cover stuff. But to piggyback off of what you said, you thinking that it's overshadowing. Yeah, it's it's not necessarily overshadowing. It's just not being out there. So from 2000 to 2017, we didn't have any statistics to really go off of. Okay, well, ding, there's something going on here. Are you... I mean, okay, so a disclaimer to, you know, folks that may be listening, I'm a pharmacist by profession. And generally the CDC publishes what they call the morbidity and mortality, you know, um, uh, data. And generally something like that should be published as part of that that's kept on uh, a periodic basis. I'm not exactly sure what the base, uh, what the timeline is when they release this information. And not only that, the World Health Organization should be another organization that should be publishing these these types of statistics because they definitely publish it for third world countries. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I mean, 
I think the research is out there, you know, as to the research is out there, but on, on a time on a periodic basis, what this what the change has been has been, whatever the time frame they used right. to measure it is. You know, for me, regardless, it's like what uh, Kira Johnson, her husband said, it really touched me because it was like, regardless of what it is, this is the United States of America. Mm -hmm. We have arguably one of the best healthcare systems in the world. Not. Well, arguably, I mean, when you look globally, it is one of the best healthcare systems in the world, depending on your skin color, it sounds like. <laughs> right? <Why not? laughs> I mean, I mean, because the health system is the health system. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody coming through that health system may not get the same quality of care, mm -hmm. but it doesn't change the fact. I have plenty of friends that are in the healthcare system, mm -hmm. excellent physicians, excellent nurses, excellent pharmacists. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that you have the human capital there. I know that a lot of the health system, I mean, these systems work, you know, for the most part, they have protocols that they follow. So I find it, like I said, it's, it, it really, it was very jarring for me because I'm like, okay, if you have a protocol that you're following, then how do people slip through the cracks? I can see if the numbers were like, you know, two, you know, they are twice as likely and that's even bad, but this is three to four times. There is a systematic breakdown. Some, something is wrong in that system because if, this is a protocol Basically, something is written down. Mm -hmm. If this happens, you do X, Y, Z. If this happens, you it does not have, you know, race or anything attached to it. So if on the back end, you're seeing that something is going on, it's maybe not the system, but it may be the people. Correct, which is the problem. So doctors per se, with their training, are trained to treat different races a little bit differently um depending on what doctor you're talking to will tell you i don't see that as a race problem i just know that african americans are more predisposed to have certain diseases like diabetes right because that was an example that was given by one of the interviews that yeah I but that's fine i mean people are predisposed to having a whole lot of things all you do is part of that patient's workup you know that this is, you know, what their history is and you treat them ac accordingly. As with diabetes, there are protocols that you follow. Okay, but to Because think it's about not that. just African-Americans or Blacks that have diabetes or, you know, preeclampsia. This is not something that is race specific. But so how come- trained that Black people have a high pain threshold. Did you know that? I'm gonna need a disclaimer right now because I'm about to go to sideways. You know, it's it's very okay. It is so now he's published. Is this uh, high pain threshold? Mm -hmm. Because when they enslaved African Americans and they branded them and you know were beating people and doing all manners of things that are you know just downright human rights abuse, they didn't die. So then you assume that they have a high, I mean, where is that coming yeah, from? Because that does, that is so nonsensical. How can you say coming that from. a group of people high, uh, have a high pain threshold? Where Fixed is the science? Where's the science? It doesn't, there's no science behind it. It just so, so back to our history. Hence why we're in the climate that we're in right now. And so this, this problem has followed us, right? Uh, From <laughs> the beginning of time for us, right? And so we're still in the year 2020 facing, oh, she has a pain high for You're not in pain. Because if you look at the studies and you look at the stories, a lot of the stories, a lot of these women, their number one complaints was, they didn't feel that I needed the pain medication. Ooh. They told me, women, like if you look at interviews, you Google, look at YouTube, a lot of women who have actually survived and didn't die during childbirth or postpartum. One of the, if they tell you, share their stories, I in particular also can relate to it. But if you look at the common theme there is they didn't believe I was going through the symptoms that I was going through. 
So in the case of Shaw Asia, she went for a routine stress test mm. and crashed during a C-section. I'm not even sure they should have been doing that, but again, we're not medical uh, experts here, but something went wrong there. Yeah, something something went wrong. So she went into some sort of emergency during the C-section, right, which their <laughs> protocols, again, to in, handle that. In the case of Kira, right? They had 12 hours. Okay. Let me breathe because I don't want to pass out. Okay. I was, like I said, I was just so, it was rage mm -hmm. watching that video. Because I'm sitting there listening to her husband talking about how- He didn't want to be- she, They started seeing wow. blood. And I said, okay. And then they ordered the scan. It wasn't very clear to me how long it took from the time they ordered the scan which if you just you know gave birth and you're bleeding that's an emergency they order the scan how long it took for them to actually do the scan but i know and it's i have to go back to listen to the it video it, no, it's not it clear. took it's it took seven hours to get her into the or i believe you know it's not clear and let me tell you the part that is like you know because i was like what this is cedar cyanide hospital one of the top hospitals in the world. So something clearly happened in that situation. And I think even part of, you know, the feedback that the hospital gave, yes, they were like, this was something went very, very wrong because this should not happen. I cannot, it, I cannot even begin to, it, underscore the importance of really advocating for yourself really having and, and and unfortunately you know i think sometimes is because we sometimes look at healthcare practitioners here um and being one i'll be honest with you i will scream at someone i will okay so because and he advocated for his wife yeah that situation years yeah that situation like i said it just had me boiling because but that's the problem dd it falls on deaf ears it falls on deaf ears that's the problem they're complaining i've got pain they can complain something's not right i know my body something's just not right yeah no. i i yeah i, rem I remember the article i read about serena williams and you know her having to really really you know tell the doctor hey look you need to do a scan you know like right i next. was like what i mean so the problem is wow. we are advocating for ourselves hence why it's very important to emphasize that this is not a class issue so mm -mm. she could be the most educated woman who no. knows how to advocate for herself she still does not get yeah. the help she needs it's so like you're clearly, you're ignored yes so clearly it's that's this is why we have to really put the spotlight on this this is a race issue but it, i don't know if it's necessarily a race issue and in prepping, well, let me let me clarify but y'all before y'all come for me, please don't come for me. Just listen to what I'm, I'm trying to say. I'm trying to clarify a point when I say I don't think it's necessarily a race issue from the standpoint of the person that is the provider is of a different race than the receiver, the patient. Because I was talking to a friend of mine earlier and trying to prep for this and, and she was like, yeah, this this thing goes across races. So from a provider standpoint, you have Blacks, African-Americans that are healthcare providers and you're getting the same type of treatment. Correct. As in the stats are the same. So that's why I say that, you know, because you would think from a race, because when we label it, it's a race right. issue, people will assume that, oh, it's some other race that's doing this. Mm -hmm. But this is not just- I see where you're coming from. One particular race. This is just a healthcare system issue that the way that they perceive blacks 
and African Americans when it comes to our ability to, I, what was it that I was, uh, 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 she, she was telling me, she was like one, because um, she knows someone that went through a, a, a very difficult situation as well. They don't want to give you pain meds because they believe that blacks are more sus susceptible to being addicted to opioids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, again, this person are, is having a baby. These are the sort of kind of the rules and the guidelines that have been placed, which binds, it puts whoever the healthcare provider is, it puts them in a bind. I'm not able to administer this to you because research says you could be addicted to this pain med if I give it to you, if I administer it to you. So it is a race issue because no matter who's implementing the care now, they've been put in a bind. So that's why it's still very much a racial issue. So it really is, again, not looking at it from who the healthcare provider is, what the color of their skin is. It's really mm -hmm. the guidelines that have been put in there regarding the African-American female. She's more susceptible to getting um, addicted to this. She has a thick skin. Thick skin is actually- There is, there is no guideline right. like that. That, but there, that is not that is not scientific. Guidelines are based on science, CDC. and that and is not science. Dr. Huh? William Callaghan from the uh -huh. CDC uh -huh. definitely put his stamp on this is a race issue. No, I'm not saying it's not a race issue. But what I'm saying is that when you look at what you are supposed to do, mm -hmm. you don't have a footnote you don't have like some sort of text that basically calls out okay these particular group of people it's like it's like some sort of bias that is it built is. in it is. into whoever the provide it's it's in the provider's way it's in their head on how they perceive who their patient is you know what i mean so it's it's almost like we need a re-education on Correct. that or or better yeah not even a re-education it needs to be part of the curriculum the educational you know curriculum for nurses and physicians across the board i don't think it should just be limited to those that you know care for you know women that you know the ops and gynae um physicians i think it should be across the board because i think this thing if we were to like look at it across the board the type of care that African-Americans and minority receive, it's gonna be subpar. It's gonna be problematic with every specialty area. When you've had a problem for so long, from really the beginning of time, how yeah. soon are we gonna get resolved on this issue? I'll tell you what, during the birth of my third child, the anesthesiologist was telling me, well, you're, you're almost there. You know, you've done this twice. I think you can push this. You can, I looked at that man and told him, sir, sir, I don't care if this baby's head is, if I'm crowning already, I'm going to get this epidural because I need it to push out this baby. How dare you, number one, being a man, tell me whether or not I should have this epidural. When I've told you in my birth plan that I want an epidural. But now because of shenanigans that have gone on and now it's late, uh, you know, oh, you're so dilated now you can, who? I don't want to have to yeah. do that. So what would you do if you found yourself in a situation yeah, so number one, because of course, if you asked me this question yesterday with me being very naive about a lot of things, my response probably would have been a little bit different. Um, because I consider myself to be very savvy. I, mm -hmm. One of the things that I have realized through my years of you know working within the industry is that you kind of need to really know how to navigate the system. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't know how to navigate the system, because number one, you have to understand your insurance. Mm -hmm. A lot of, you know, there's a lot of things that's kind of interplayed in and that kind of, I wouldn't say necessarily dictate, but influence and impact the type of care you're going to receive. Mm -hmm. 
right? Um, first of all, the hospital you're gonna be able to go to and all these things. But in a pregnancy situation, you've already sorted all that out. Right. You already have who your physician is that you're going to give birth. One of the things is you have to, like for me, I will have to get to know my physician very well. I will tell them, you know, hey, based on the stats, this is what I am seeing. There's a probability you go in here, you don't come out. That's not going to be me. And I want both of us to be on the same page about that and us putting the things in place to make sure that I am not that statistic. Number two, whoever is going to be part of that care team in that hospital, I know depending on when you go into labor and all that, it changes because different people come at different times. My conversation is with my treating physician to let them know, hey, I just really need you to make sure that the right people are there to be part of this team. Wherever my husband is, I'm talking to him, honey, I may not be in a position to really talk. This is what I want you. I am kind of a bit neurotic when it comes to certain things. This is what I want you to do. You, you need to make it very clear to them that if anything happens to me, we're going to do an investigation. We're going to need answers. So we need to make sure that everything that's supposed to be done is done appropriately. If in the situation that you were talking about, I'm getting an epidural and that was part of my treatment plan, I'm not trying to understand what you're talking about. Because as part of my treatment plan, as part of your profession, I come, depending on the time that you show up, right? Let's say everything works out and it's perfect. I come in, you need to schedule me for my epidural. Me not getting my epidural on time, I don't understand that. And Part of it is me being naive about you know what all goes on into the process of giving birth but my expectation is there's some sort of you know scheduling involved and time frame that okay you have this time window that you have to get this done by so i i spend a lot of time trying to plan ahead so that once i have a particular relationship with who my treating physician is and i feel comfortable then I, I, I feel like I'm safe. But you know what? That's not realistic, right? Because you can go into labor at any time. You can have the most beautiful relationship with whomever you want. And then when you go into labor, they're not available and you have to deal with whoever it is. You know what I mean? So for me, it's more of, you know, putting the onus on who my partner is or whoever is going to be there to support me through this process for them to know that, hey, you really need to advocate on my behalf. You know how I am. I'm the type of person that I will be taking my phone. Now, mind you, I'm in labor. This is the t statistics that I read. I'm not trying to be part of this, okay? So y'all ain't gonna kill me, okay? So y'all gonna go up in there. Y'all gonna get this baby out. I'm gonna do my part, but if I pass out, y'all better bring me back. <laughs> that's why i have problems <laughs> in life. because honestly that is how i would I, I am very animated and i i don't i look at look i i feel like sharing information and knowledge is important talking about the truth is important however which way you feel about it that's you know and i'll let you know i'm not trying to say you know, anything personal about you, but I am afraid. I want you to know that I am afraid and I want you to know that I am putting my life in your hands and I want you to know that I want you to help me because I don't want to be that. You know what I mean? So I think for me, like I said, I'm a, I'm a little to the left when it comes to things like this because I am so frightened hearing this. I mean, this is downright scary. I can't even imagine, you know, being a woman that's pregnant or planning on getting pregnant and reading that, that is, that is just not right in any society. It's not right. I think Fox News did uh, a story on this. And um, so I'll read some of the things that, you know, they said what mm -hmm. you can do is number one, you make sure your hospital is prepared for the unexpected. So make sure they have a crash cart or anything ready for they should have that the it's a hospital well shockingly again i mean seriously some hospitals are not very well prepped for anything going left um wow. so that's part of the discovery that was made with 
why are people dying? This is something mm. that shouldn't happen. But again, too, if the white woman can be saved when she crashes, then why can't the black women be saved? So I'm not sure whether or not if there were a million equipments there to save me, if at all, I would still be brought back. Is it a crash or accident? Which one is it? Which one is it? Number two is speak up. So as much as we don't want to be labeled the angry black woman, <laughs> which is really what it takes to get the response like, listen lady or nurse or doctor, if you don't get me this stuff, this whole place will be tore up from the floor up. Um, with Kira's situation, it pained me when I heard him say, I did not want to be perceived as the angry black man. He says, I'm not a little guy, mm. but I didn't want to be perceived as that. Now, second, yeah. second pregnancy, I arrived, I was in active labor, but was told, oh, you're not, you're not there yet, go home. Good thing where I chose to deliver, like literally is a six, seven minute drive, but when I tell you I was in excruciating pain, and just so y'all know, I will be very transparent. I will be posting pictures because I did, funny enough, I had such a great support system with me with, with by second birth. And it's, it's really good to chronicle these things because you look back and I look back, it didn't hit me till later, like years later, like I was an active labor and yet these nurses sent me back home. Number one, they didn't believe I was in that much pain. They kept telling me, walk it off, walk it up. You're not that, so you must not be X, Y, and Z. And but like, what, what were they basing that on? I mean, like, cause I'm, I'm, I'm you know, um, correct. naive and don't know. So- it Wasn't fully dilated. Well, but I am seriously in serious pain. Like, I feel like, take me now, Jesus, because I can't, they were forcing me to walk. Again, these are things I'm sure you have to do to push the baby out. Well, that wasn't happening. I have a huge chunk of my mucus plug already just out, which is a big indicator that baby is ready to come out. I still got sent home. Like literally sent home. And finally I was like, listen, you can't send me <sighs> home anymore. The angry black woman had to come out so you got sent home twice? Twice. Wow. Like within, wow. and I have all my times because I was, you know, recording my my um, contractions. And um, it's it's really painful because when you see people- Oh, wow. Died, I mean- When you see people who've died from it and you know that you could have been that person, it it's a different reality for you. So to anyone, I guess, who is, trying to be pregnant or is pregnant or looking for this to be their future become the angry black woman because that's what works and literally <laughs> it's what works. your husband should become the angry black man because that's what works the third thing that they said get proactive with your health control with your health control the things you can and i guess this is for the disadvantaged community you know, they don't go through, they don't go for their prenatal appointments mm -hmm. and stuff like that. You know, just advising those kind of people to, you know, to just be more proactive with their health care. Yeah. Um, Shahesha Washington. Washington. Mm -hmm. um, Amy Schumer, the actress, you know, I read a, a post, an Instagram post mm -hmm. about too, with her trying to shed some light. And I didn't even know this too. Like, in New York, you're 12 times more likely to die. Don't, 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 don't say it. I, I'm just, I'm so undone. So, so. <laughs> so the rate is even higher in New York for a black woman. Um, and I guess some of the guidelines that have been put in place now too is, um, you know, uh, I think the term is post-mortem, you know, every recorded death now, the, the survey, which was missing, which was a key as to why the statistics were off from the year 2000 to 2017 mm -hmm. was they were not properly recording uh, deaths related to pregnancies. 
And so one of the things that have been put in place is to um, put the question, have they, were they recently pregnant or even postpartum up to a year? Because we're finding out that, right, people are still having mortality right. because of complications. Yeah, because it takes your body time to heal. Right. I mean, having a baby is very, is very traumatic to the body. So it's going to take time for your body to kind of come back together. So yeah, I could see that. Another um, story that I, I, I um, watched was um, the husband, this couple were so scared that they had a son or maybe two sons and she wanted a daughter. So she went through a really crazy experience, right? With the second pregnancy. And they wanted to try a third time to have a girl, but because of what she went through, the second pregnant yeah. almost died. She, I mean, it, this was a done deal for her now. Like, Yeah, my I, girlfriend, I mean, she was like, yeah, she feels that, you know, um, whites are more believed when they complain than blacks because of the bias of, okay, blacks are stronger, blacks can withstand more, and Caucasians are more fragile. Um, I mean, it's like some of these things you find it so, so difficult to believe, but you know it's true. Um, because in your mind, you're like, huh? I mean, we're both reasonable people. You're like, how? So I don't think it's necessarily some folks that they are actually aware of what they're doing. And that's why I think- What do you mean by that? What, what folks? As in the provider. Again, going back to the provider, okay. because I always kind of look for the path forward because I think that, okay, one path forward is to make sure that those that are, as in, you know, minority women that are expecting that are pregnant, that they advocate for themselves and do all the things that we talked about. Mm -hmm. I think that's one part, but this is a societal problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the path to fixing that should not only be the sole responsibility of the citizen, as in the patient. It should also be the responsibility of the community to say, okay, what is going on here and how can we fix this? And I think that they needs to be, and I haven't done research to see whether this exists, but I think that medical schools, they need to take this up as something very important and start putting together curriculum that addresses it, that helps to kind of make people more aware of, of this and, you know, how to, when you're treating and interacting with your patient to keep these things in the back of your mind, to make sure that you're not causing, I mean, the Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm. Mm -hmm. So that is solely what you are there to do. You're there to care for your patients and make sure that your patient, you know, they came in sick, that they leave well to the best of your ability. But if there's something going on and there's a crack in the system, is the responsibility of the healthcare practitioners to say, hey, what do we need to do to make sure we are sticking by our oath mm -hmm. when it comes to all communities, you know? So I think that that needs to be something that's really, really, I would like to see the medical community push on their end. Because you can't just say, okay, as a patient, you just go in there, no. This is your job. I mean, think about it. If any one of us are working, their expectations as to, you know, what that pro productivity is supposed to look like. You know, if you're productive, what's the outcome? If there's something going on, as in you're making mistakes, something is happening, then generally what happens is you have a re-education, you have a retraining, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um so I, I hope that that is something that the hospital systems, if the academic centers are not looking at it, as in, you know, the schools putting it as part of their curriculum, then the health systems need to educate. And Congress just needs to pass the bill, period. I mean, 
funding yeah. is part of a big, a, I mean, a huge part of trying to implement those things, right? Because for school to now introduce a curriculum to educate its students about this, it's going to need funding. I think it's, it starts with, you know, the things that you pointed out that you know us advocate first of all i think it starts even before it starts with awareness i wasn't that aware of it <laughs> you know what i mean um so i think it's just an awareness across the board within our community um it's also an opportunity for the individual to act, to advocate for themselves and the reason i say awareness within our community is we have healthcare practitioners that are in the healthcare systems where all these you know, unfortunate incidences occur that are minorities. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of, oh, how is such and such doing? That patient, she's okay? Everything going okay? Okay. Because the more people check in and ask questions, the more folks kind of button up it. So I think what we are doing here is important. It needs to be more part of the conversation. It's just, I mean, I'm not trying to compare this to Black Lives Matter. Um, that's a completely different subject for a different for a different day but the police brutality once we started having camera phones mm -hmm. because before people would talk about it and people would be like oh you're exaggerating i mean is it really i mean it's i mean but when you start seeing certain things you're like whoa yes, <laughs> is. this is not part of training yeah. what, what is going on here um so I think it's just that, that again, as the awareness, and I don't think that this should just be, you know, what happens, you know, within the black community or minority, all communities, if there are groups of people that are being marginalized in any way or being treated, you know, in a disadvantaged way, we are a community. We need to advocate for them. Advocate, yes. Yes, because they, there is no reason why in this country we talk about America being one of the greatest countries in the world. Yeah. It's about setting examples that it is true. You come here, you have an opportunity. We don't look at you based on your socioeconomic class. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Well, <laughs> this is the idealistic, you know, yeah. person in me that we need, we have a standard that we have to adhere to as a country and we have to, we are not perfect, but we have to continuously work towards it. So something like this, you know, my prayer is that we're going to hear more people talk about it. We're going to see more healthcare systems take it seriously. You don't have to have a whole curriculum. You could just do, you know, a lunch and learn as part of, you know, HR or something. I don't know. Just yeah. Put, put, put some slides together and just talk about the statistics in your hospital. You don't have to go and talk about the national average. Talk about, okay, as long as you're in this hospital, this is one of the quality indicators that we're going to have. Maternal mortality for minorities. And it need, we need to start evening things up. You know what I mean? So that can be something that a hospital takes on. And then you can actually use that as a way of advertising your business. That, hey, you come here, you know, we, we have a center of excellence for childbirth and you provide your statistics, you know? Um, and then when it comes to the schools, again, you know, yeah, we could talk about funding. We're not saying that you need to have a whole class. You can find a way to incorporate it in one of those classes. I mean, are you kidding me? There are so many classes, mm -hmm. you know, you, any class that talks about like health disparity, epidemiology, whatever, you can incorporate it as part of that. You know what I mean? So there, there are innovative ways of doing things from a private, you know, standpoint versus waiting for government to, to pass laws. So in the meantime, people are just supposed to die. That's not right. We've raised some good points here. Um, and I would like for this to be one of the issues that these, uh, that this platform actually, you know, um, rallies for, um, just being a personal, just, it really hits close to home. And uh, do you have any last notes you would like to share before we wrap up this episode? <laughs> I mean, this was great. You know, I, I didn't know what to expect. And, um, uh, the topic was excellent. 
Um, I think that it touched on so many parts of both of our lives. Um, and I'm really, really excited to dig further because to your point to, you know, make this particular issue a part of, you know, the core of this platform, I think is important, you know, for you to do that. And it gives the opportunity to, you know, continuously do the research and see, kind of see how the needle is moving. Exactly. And, you know, who is doing what. And I mean, you can get to the point where, you know, we start actually researching individual hospitals and look at what their rates are and you post that. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, hey, you know, you can't come and tell me to take it down. Your facts are your facts. Spotlight on you. Yeah. You yeah. know, so I think it's important because I think I am a firm believer in, you know, information and knowledge equates power and, you know, some sort of positive action. I'm a very positive person, so I try to keep it in that lane. <laughs> but that's the whole point is to is to arm people so that they can, you know, make informed choices. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go to this hospital because once you start yeah. knowing which hospital, I can decide to go to this hospital. And I tell you, one thing that gets the private sector to react quicker than anything else, even the you know, some of the public is money. Mm -hmm. When money starts leaving, people start asking, what exactly happened? <laughs> what can we do? What can we do to get the money back? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So that's my wrap up. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so, thank you all for tuning in to this episode, our very first episode. We're excited to bring you more content. Dance the world with kindness. You better subscribe. <laughs> I kid, I kid. Please subscribe. Thank you for your support.